and I am live. The camera is dirty, so I'm gonna clean it off. Let's see here. Okay, that should be better. So, I'm a little late today, guys, but today we're gonna talk about conservation and what that means and what is conservation and what historically has the word preservation applied to in the United States and then talk a little bit about how possibly the word preservation came to be associated with the captive breeding of reptiles and why I think that um, using that word can uh, be problematic um, and I think there's a better word for it. So welcome, welcome, welcome. My name's Tom and I just started this live. I go live at about 11 o'clock or so. I'm about 30 minutes late every Sunday morning. Um, although I haven't committed quite to that yet. So uh, when you jump on, please tell me your name and we're gonna have a talk about conservation today and I'll, I'm gonna cut this off at noon. So let's talk about it. Conservation and preservation. Th these are two words that are often defined uh, with each other. And if you look up the definition of conservation, you're going to find a lot of different things for the definition of conservation. And when you look at who is giving you the definition of what conservation is, you're going to see different biases in that definition. And so, for example, I was just talking to my co-host of the Let's Talk Turtles podcast, uh, Ryan, and he is doing hunter education. And in hunter education, the online course, conservation is defined as essentially wildlife management that includes hunting. So you can't have conservation without hunting, whereas preservation is conservation without hunting. Isn't that interesting? Um, but here's the bottom line. In, in this country, in the 20th century, the last century, the first half of the century, and really the first few decades of the century, there was this raging debate about how to best manage the remaining natural lands and wildlife in this country. And there were kind of two big points of view. One was the conservationist movement, which was led by Gifford Pinchot, who would go on to create the U.S. National Forest Service. And Gifford Pinchot believed that the country's lands should be managed by people for the benefit of people. You know, a really intense management of that land. This was the Gifford Pinchot camp. He would go on to create the U.S. Forest Service, which protects large amounts of forest, but the U.S. Forest Service basic philosophy is that these forests are to be used. So you have logging and hunting in forests. You have um, sometimes oil and gas extraction in the forest. So you have a lot of different types of use of natural lands. And then you have the opposite side. You have what we call the preservation movement in this country. And this movement was led by John Muir, uh, who did a lot of work in California and tried to protect some of these massive uh, natural areas in California from conservation, in essence. So back then, building a dam on a big river and using that to harvest the water power for the benefit of people, that was viewed as conservation. You're, you're using nature, you're building a lake, you're providing recreational opportunities for people. And so that is conservation, kind of man and nature living in, in harmony together. Whereas John Muir said, no, we need to preserve these places. We need to set them aside and let them be 
nature. And so John Muir's philosophy was more captured in the National Park Service. And so that is why we have these two different agencies, there's some other ones too, that manage land very differently. The US National Forest Service and the US Park Service. Park Service grew out of this ethic of preservation and the National Forest Service grew out of this ethic of conservation. However, what happened over time? We realized that this whole preservation ethic, this idea of setting aside land and its wildlife and like literally putting a box around it or putting up gates and allowing very limited access to the people, that wasn't realistic because we now know that we are changing the climate. We are um, altering things um, in nature by what we do in our man and human created systems. There's no difference. It's one big planet. And so gradually, the word preservation for the land management and wildlife preservation movement in this country really was kind of abandoned. And conservation became a much broader term. And what most land managers do today is what we would all call conservation. Humans are interfering and interacting with the land to manage that land, to make it better for some population of animals or plants. Now, there's still a raging debate about how you should manage conservation lands. Um, should you manage it very limited uh, or should you actively uh, go in and you know cut trees down to bring back grouse populations or uh, you know spray herbicide on state nature preserves? I mean, in 1970, nobody thought we would be spraying herbicide all over our state nature preserves and that's what we're doing because there are so many invasive plants that have come from these non-natural areas. And so today, I would have to say our conservation ethic has grown and expanded and we as a country accept that people manage the landscape. People manage wildlife populations, and it's absolutely okay to do that. Whereas 100 years ago, there was a whole camp of people that said, just set it aside and don't touch it. Yeah, there's still some of those people out there, but their voices are fewer and fewer uh, each year, unfortunately. Um, now, what, what, what does this mean? So... I, I want to give you an example of modern day preservation. And it was from an episode of the podcast. And it was when Anthony and company had uh, the people from Japan and Okinawa who were working with the uh, Maremi's Japonica. This is a very um, rare turtle in Japan. It only grows on, or lives on one island. I'm, I'm a plant guy, so sorry. Um, and so many of us hear that the, the uh, Maremi's Japonica is a national landmark in Japan. And that doesn't, what, like, what does that mean? How can an animal be a landmark? I mean, that doesn't really make any sense. Um, well, lots of, gets lost in translation, but if you go back and listen to that podcast, uh, with the people that are studying it, what they said there is that it was very hard for them to get permits to study that turtle. And there you go. That's the preservation ethic. So in Japan, the people there said basically, no, this turtle is so important. We're not going to mess with it. We are just going to say that is where it lives. Don't touch it. Don't mess with it. Even scientists can't mess with it. Um, they don't do lots of things probably to conserve the habitat. They don't study it in depth. They're not putting radio trackers and radio collars on the turtles. Um, if, if we look back at the 20th century definition of the word preservation, 
then um, what the Japanese people are, are, how they're managing their wildlife is much more akin to how a, a preservation ethic. So let's go to the world of captive breeding reptiles and amphibians, okay? And I think personally that because the word preservation was not as common and, and not as frequent anymore and sort of the conservation ethic won out and in our country what when we say conservation what we're um, mostly meaning is people professional people working to conserve wildlife by managing their populations in the wild and manipulating their habitats uh, so that they can continue in the wild so that's really what mainline conservation has become and because our country is becoming ever, uh, ever um, professional and we are dividing up our responsibilities and becoming specialists for everything, I mean, you have a whole group of people in this country that today are uh, material girl. Yes, shout out for sure. Uh, we, we, you have this whole cadre of professional conservationists, and I'm one of them. And we spend a lot of time building up our uh, what we do in our profession. Um, if Whereas 60, 70 years ago, I think there was more of a conservation ethic. Many, many people lived on land and had land. And so they could directly participate in conservation. Um, we can still participate in conservation today. Um, however, uh, I think it's a little more difficult and it's a little more abstract. So... Sometime the word preservation started to be applied to uh, the private keeping of turtle and tortoises. Now, I, I can only think that uh, Russ Gurley's um, defining the turtle and tortoise preservation group, um, that is where that word came from. <laughs> I can, I'm, I've been researching how this may have started, and, and I don't hear snake people talk about preservation, but I do hear turtle people talk about it all the time. And even if you go back and read some papers from the early 2000s, before TTPG was created, you, you don't really hear people talk about preservation of wildlife, you know, by captive breeders. I mean, this is a new use of this word within the past 10 to 20 years, and it's really, really picked up steam in the past two or three years. Now, let me tell you why I have somewhat of an issue with it. Because I think when we, when we say that, well, we're not doing conservation, we're doing preservation, what that does is create a barrier and a wall between um, what we do and somehow elevates it as more important than the other types of conservation or preservation. And quite frankly, what I like to say we do, we do herpeticulture and how we apply her pediculture um, is is key. Um, but if you go back to the original kind of conservation ethic put forth by Gifford Pinchot, guess what? It, in my opinion, raising turtles and tortoises in captivity, captivity for the benefit of people is more a attuned to the classic conservation ethic. You know, if if we are taking animals from the wild and reproducing them, we are using that habitat. Uh, you, we are using those animals for the benefit of people, but at the same time, um, theoretically, the wildlife in the habitats could also benefit if it's done sustainably. Um, and managed appropriately. And this is the whole reason CITES is established, to do that. Does it work? No. Wildlife is trafficked all the time. CITES has a problem. But theoretically, that's how it's supposed to work. CITES is supposed to ensure the sustainable harvest of wildlife so that animals aren't impacted in the wild and humans benefit at the same time. If that's not conservation, um, Looking back at the original John Muir uh, definition of conservation, um, I, 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 I'm 
missing something because I really do think maybe at a base base level, using turtles and tortoises as people's pets um, is conservation as at a basic level. Now, um, I think we can do a lot more than that. And so the term that I like to use is what I call ex situ conservation. So today, ex situ conservation is the word that professionals that work in botanical gardens like myself and zoos are starting to use for the managing of populations of wildlife in a uh, situation where they are harvest, where they are um, working through, um, you know, just outside of the habitat. So conservation through communication, absolutely, Josh. That if you take a look at my post, that is one of the criteria. So if we are truly going to be conservationists and have uh, assurance colonies, we used to use that word a lot, and I don't hear it anymore. Um, private assurance colonies, um, we have to support in-situ conservationists. There are people out there that think that um, somehow keeping reptiles and amphibians as pets is the only way uh, that these animals are gonna live and be around. And quite frankly, that is, is just not true. <laughs> Um, there are, there's millions, billions of dollars being spent on wildlife conservation in the wild to protect these animals. And what we are doing is making backups of wild populations. And if what we do can support those wild populations, then ultimately what we do will be recognized by the professional conservation world as important. And so... The flip side of this, if we kind of get on our high horse and say, oh, well, all of these laws and all of these people that are uh, trying to protect these animals in the wild, um, they're just, uh, they're just, they don't get the point of it. You know, the point is to make as many turtles as you can. We're always going to have this disconnect. Um, if we don't support CITES, if we don't support the Endangered Species Act, um, we as private turtle keepers um, are never going to be recognized for the skills and the abilities that we have. And so ultimately, that's why I think we should be using terms like assurance colonies and ex situ conservation. We should work together. We should educate. We should manage the populations. We should collaborate. Uh, none of this means that we have to give up our animals uh, it, it, it can be voluntary, but ultimately, that is my thought on all of this preservation and conservation uh, things. I, 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 I sit in the middle. I sit in the middle because I'm in both worlds all the time. And so let's go to the chat. Uh, Bathyphila, thanks for joining me. Josh is here. Um, Josh, conservation through commercialization is a line of bull crap, in my opinion. Um, if, if we look at um, the numbers, uh, it's shocking. It's, it, 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 the system has not worked. And for every species that has been established in the trade, there's, there's a hundred and, and hundreds of thousands of animals it's just, it's, it's not something we should be saying, in my opinion. Um, it doesn't work. There's no data. It's just a claim. Um, shout out from the Philippines. Hi, Trisha. Um, Bathy Phyllis says, I think one thing that we take for granted is the captive breeding reduces demand for wild caught, which is not necessarily true. Ball, th ba ball pythons and certain dart frog uh, species being examples. So here's the deal. If we manage the captive collection of wildlife trade, um, it doesn't matter <laughs> if we're, we can still collect wild animals. And that's the problem. Um, we're not managing it well. Yes, CITES and uh, the Endangered Species Act are established, but instead of, um, instead of, um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting tired. It, 
in, instead of like saying these things are bad, no, they need more money. They need more funding. Um, they're, they're really great ideas. And yeah, maybe we need to tweak them over time. However, the, the answer is not getting rid of them. Um, the, the whole reason why things like Egyptian tortoises are going on the Endangered Species Act is, you know, we have a lot of Libyan tortoises coming into this country right now. And they're all being, uh, all coming in illegally. There's no legal export out of uh, Libya of these tortoises. But the U.S. government can't do a damn thing because they're a, a foreign tortoise species. I mean, yeah, they could prosecute under the Lacey Act because they were illegally harvested uh, in another country. But guess what? If, if the Libyan tortoise were on the Endangered Species Act, number one, nobody would be bringing it into the country um, because they just wouldn't. And number two, um, if they did, they would get caught and the federal government would prosecute them because it was on the Endangered Species Act. So, um, so bottom line, I have very different viewpoints on this from the uh, reptile community as a whole. In general, I think there are a lot of myths thrown out. And um, what, what I encourage you to do is really dive into the data. And so I sit as a professional conservationist um, who sees a lot of good and a lot of value uh, in the world of herpetoculture and private uh, turtle and tortoise keeping. However, um, right now, there's a huge, huge divide between the two camps. And um, for me, that just, it makes me want to puke because I see so much potential, but so much is being lost uh, because people are putting themselves in these camps and ultimately we're not working together. So, um, Bethy Phyllis says, yeah, we're not saying we should get rid of CITES or ESA, quite the opposite, yeah. Um, yeah, captive bred, captive breeding doesn't seem to have much effect on the demand for wild caught. People want a nice tortoise. And I mean, I, I can't speak for snakes and, and other things, but for turtles and tortoises, you can't sell a tor turtle and tortoise legally under this country uh, under four inches. So in my opinion, that fuels the demand for adult wild-caught tortoises, uh, cheap wild-caught tortoises. Um, the other thing about this is we have to think the other way. So the, the Asian turtle crisis is going to be the American turtle crisis because um, now the animals that are poached in this country, guess what? They're being sent to Asia. <laughs> and so the Asians don't want our baby captive bred turtles. Um, if you go online to some of these groups, they are looking for the best and brightest and boldest uh, Eastern box turtles that are plucked from the wild that have absolutely perfect shells. Um, and um, that's what they're looking for. They don't want our captive bred babies. They don't want to raise up babies. They want them perfect and mature right there, uh, grown in the wild. And, you know, that's why we have people uh, go uh, go um, get them. So, Bathy Phyllis says, in my... You know, in an ideal world, we'd only import for wild caught, well, import wild caught for breeders, not the pet market. Exactly. And so, how how would we implement that, right? Um, we would reduce quotas, um, drive the price of the animals up, and then people that are truly working to um, uh, breed. Um, then they would be the ones that are buying them. And I mean, let's face it, most breeders are not buying wild caught animals. Um, Dan says, it's such a misinformed law, I hate it so much. So Dan, um, do, you, do you hate the law or do you hate that people are so misinformed in the herpetoculture community? Um, if it's the latter, um, we're, we're in agreement. Um, people are really misinformed and I get it. I get it. No one wants to lose their turtles or tortoises and no one wants to 
lose the flexibility that comes with being able to um, offer your animals for sale and continue to grow what you're doing um, and providing better care for your animals. There are very few people that can just do this out of the kindness of their hearts. Um, if I had to stop selling my surplus today, um, I would, and it would, it would um, reduce probably the number of animals I produce, um, but I would still produce the right bloodlines and manage the population. So, so that's my point, guys. I, I'm coming from this as a person who's a professional conservationist, as a person that worked for the Natural Resources Agency in my state uh, for most of my adult life from the time I was uh, 20 until the time I was 42. Um, so I have a lot of experience with the Endangered Species Act. Um, I worked side by side by the conservationists that use the Endangered Species Act as a tool every day. And um, I, I got to tell you that people don't want to come to or be involved in herpetoculture anymore that are in the private conservation world because of this huge divide that, that we have. And um, it's ugly, it's ugly. But guess what? This is kind of a sign of our country and we are more divided. We're as divided as ever. And um, I like to pull us together. So Dan says the four inch Rule law based on a false supposition of lawmakers and salmonella bacteria. Ah, yeah. So it's interesting how laws get made. Uh, I'll tell you, Dan, I, I interviewed um, Mark Wallet from uh, the Little Rescue Turtle Sanctuary in Canada. And you know what he said? He said he sure wishes they had that four inch law in Canada because in Canada, Baby red dirt sliders were allowed to be sold for a long, long, long time. And, um, I mean, uh, ultimately I want my, what I try to do is to get people to think. Um, there's a divide. Um, here's kind of why the divide exists. Um, I know Dylan from Animals at Home talked about how he had trouble finding wildlife charities that would accept donations from his podcast because it deals with a pet trade. Absolutely. I mean, that that's horrible. But guess what? We've created that reality. And why have we created that reality? Well, look at many of the major uh, people in this industry that started it. Many were convicted of wildlife crimes and went to prison. And that's the, the reality of the situation. So we are always, always, always going to be on the defensive unless we start actively calling out um, the bad stuff. And uh, I know Dylan talks a lot about animal welfare. Um, the government doesn't have enough money to enforce the wildlife laws. And we are uh, the government, in my opinion, in, here in this country. Um, so if we are standing by and watching illegal things happen, then it's just as bad as doing it ourselves. And guess what? That is gonna, hap that is gonna lead to the demise of the hobby, of, of the reptile hobby. Um, straight up. I love the reptile hobby. Um, my work with hingebacks, I see that as in-situ conservation, uh, private in-situ conservation of hingeback tortoises, collaborating with others to create assurance colonies of these species in the United States. We have bearded dragons. We have leopard geckos. I have my chameleon breeding project. Uh, th this is all her pedoculture. I'm doing this for fun. I'm doing it because it enhances my life. I'm doing it because I think it has the potential to enhance the lives of other people. I think it uh, brings awareness to um, other causes. Like, 
in the wild. Um, but if if there, I'll tell you, there's something wrong in the world of tortoise and turtle and tortoise keeping. If we think that putting an animal on the endangered species list is going to lead to its extinction, like that, it just it's a myth. Um, and we just need to get over ourselves. And it, it's not about us. It's about the turtles. Uh, Bathy Phyllis says, yeah, the hobby has another problem that nobody talks about of glorifying working with animals that original that originate from smuggled stock, which is illegal. Yeah. Fruit of the poison tree and Lacey Act. So, yeah, I mean, if you read the Lacey, Lacey Act, Probably I could be arrested for having a bearded dragon. Um, um, but yeah, it basically says if the animal is acquired illegally, it's illegal to have. Now, the federal government can't regulate it. Um, it doesn't have enough resources. But if we're not regulating it, if we're thinking it's a good idea to have a legal stock, and the, the, the thing, here's the deal. You, you need to make sure it's legal. That is what ethical means. So instead of just saying, oh, well, a guy sold it to me, we need to say um, that, where did you get this animal? Did you breed this? When, I, when, when people start giving me short one answer things for that question, I start leaving. I'm not gonna talk to them. I'm not gonna consider acquiring the animal. It's ridiculous. Um, you should be able to tell me exactly where that animal came from, who you bought it from. Um, why is that a secret? Dan S. Yes, I've heard multiple biologists on podcasts slamming the pet trade and keepers. They like to say that they should be left in the wild. Her petaculture is fun and does bring about awareness. I, I agree, Dan. I don't know why we can't have both. And in that is why when people say what we do is preservation, it, that is just kind of a joke to me because traditionally in our country, preservation has me meant keep the animals in the wild. Um, conservation is the ethic about working with an animal and learning about an animal in all different kinds of ways for the benefit of people and the benefit of that animal. Um, Dan S. says, I've heard botanists say similar things about bonsai collectors. Um, yeah, so I'm in the plant world. Um, people are stealing plants like crazy. And the thing about plants is that they are private property, in, at least in this country. Um, so you can be arrested for things like theft. Wildlife is not private property. So, you know, if you have a... Uh, wild box turtle on your property and someone steals it, well, that's a crime against the country or, or your state. But if someone steals your tree, that's a, that's a personal theft. And Dan, I am a botanist. Um, I've worked for 20 years conserving uh, plants in the wild. Bathy Phil says, yeah, there was a big article a few years back about a guy who got nailed smuggling pitcher plants. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, where do they come from? Um, do you think that they are all ethically sourced? Why can't we trace this uh, stuff? Yeah, Buy, buying them off of eBay and Indonesia, Indonesia and the like. And so that that is why th this stuff is so rampant. That is why biologists like myself are coming out, and I'm not saying this, but others similar to me are saying, no, people shouldn't have this. And I think that's pretty regressive. Um, I, I, I think that is, is just, uh, it's, it's like saying, we are the people that are better than everybody else. Um, I think everybody can have it, but let's just do it ethically. And if we're ethically, if we all buy things, if we work together, if we get out of this, just acquire this turtle, oh, that's rare, you know, then we will be better and do better. Um, but if we're competing and if we're just building a collection, then guess what? We're gonna have this stuff keep going and going and going. 
So I'm a strong believer in personal accountability and, um, you know, let's do the right thing, people. Let's do the right thing. So, okay, guys, that's my thoughts. I've been wanting to do this for a while. Um, bit of a rant, but uh, kind of that's the history and that's sort of how I feel. So um, think about it. Um, have a wonderful weekend and I will see you this week and uh, talk to you later. Have a good one.